from Chelsea. Okay. okay, Chelsea. Good to go. Should I go ahead? All right. Um, well, welcome everybody. I'm really excited to see, uh, I can't see all the participants at once, but um, thanks so much for coming to the IACS uh, seminar. Uh, Liliana Davalos is a uh, professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolution and an affiliate of IACS. Um, Liliana did her PhD at Columbia University and she works on uh, kind of an amazing diversity of topics. I think probably has the biggest uh, intellectual spread of anyone in our department, um, but it ranges from bat conservation as you were just hearing about um, the phylogenetics of bats, uh, other big phylogenetic um, you know, issues, uh, and also in a whole range of disease modeling and spread, uh, particularly with the rise of, of coronavirus. So anyways, uh, Liliana is going to talk about how she integrates all of that biology into big data, and I'll turn it over to her. So thanks, Liliana. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Heather. Thanks for that introduction. And before I get started, I just want to thank, um, uh, well, Stony Brook, you know, the, the basically the funding sponsors that include the, the university, of course, and the National Science Foundation and the Human Frontiers of Science program, which have funded some of the research that you're about to see in the lab. And then that logo up top with the bat kind of looking at some DNA or, or you know, echolocating at some DNA, that's uh, the logo for one of the projects that's now closed that I'm, I'm going to present some results from. And uh, I try to make this, you know, as conversational as possible. So feel free to jump in. I think we're going to have. I, I expect that we are actually going to have a lot of time to interact. So, hoping. And in okay, uh, in introducing my lab, uh, I always like to show this in which we have this center that's biodiversity. We're centered on biological diversity, but we're coming at it from completely different perspectives. On one series of perspectives, we look at how evolution increases this biological diversity and. When I say biodiversity, I'm really talking both about the number of species, uh, which is a common notion of what, you know, the richness of species that we see, but also the traits that those species have. And those traits, there's a diversity of traits from functional traits that you can measure directly to um, some of the life histories that some organisms have that I'm going to introduce to, uh, to actual, um, uh, you know, diversity uh, at the molecular level. On the other hand, I have another line of work that I'm not going to be discussing today that is on extinction and the process of extinction, both in deep time and the, the change, the anthropogenic changes, like we were talking at the very beginning, things like climate change, but, but uh, usually about land use change and how they tend to lose biodiversity. So these areas um, that are interconnected through biological diversity, they define three very different sets of questions. Uh, in the first area, which is what Heather was alluding to, talking about phylogenetics and phylogenomics, how does this biodiversity change in time and space? Uh, in the center in biodiversity, it has to do more with, with some functional process, especially at the molecular level. What are the biological processes that fuel this biodiversity? And finally, um, we have what are the social factors of environmental degradation, which is uh, um, an area of research that I've had the good fortune of having uh, particular you know, students and interaction with IACS through the STRIDE program, right? So to give an overview of all these things would uh, take us a long time. So I decided to just kind of like summarize, you know, just kind of like put a, a set of papers from the last four years that we've published and the kind of topics that they span, which, which are diverse, they range from thinking about inequality, uh, both social inequality, inequality in land tenure as a factor in, in environmental degradation, conservation, particularly in the Amazon Andes. I'm, I'm really interested in thinking about what are the processes that could lead to st stability of the forest frontier in the Amazon, on which the life of the entire planet depends, but also have to do with tropical adaptations, adaptations that organisms in the tropics have. And we've published a fair number of those, uh, including tropical mountains, which are really special. Uh, tools for genomics, so tools for actually understanding uh, how these molecular processes happen. And the, the sort of place where it all started from was in biodiversity in space and biodiversity in time. And my lab is still publishing on that, um, both uh, with fossils and so especially like in deep time and biodiversity across space in different areas. So uh, if you want to see, you know, what the last four years, these are some of my favorite papers that, that we've worked on in the lab. But uh, obviously I'm not going to be talking about all this because then we would spend a lot of time and we wouldn't be very focused. Instead, 
I'm going to talk about uh, three projects that are all centered on or that have a very strong bioinformatics component when it comes to genomics and three projects that have this common thread that they have genomics or transcriptomics and, 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 and they have this also this common thread of trying to look at the functional processes, the functional biology process. The first project is called Dimensions of Biodiversity and it was a, a six year project um, that I'll describe in some detail. Another project that uh, has begun over the last three years and, and we, are, um, we have a big goal and we're hoping that you know, it will last several years called BAT 1K. And then finally, I'll talk about one of the more recent projects that's funded by the Human Frontiers and it's about shrews, which um, these, these are Eurasian shrews, these are not North American shrews, but uh, these shrews have, have some uh, amazing traits that we think are worth studying in great detail. So I was saying how this Dimensions, um, Dimensions of Biodiversity project uh, has been running for six years. It just ended this year. And we had a very ambitious goal when we started out back in the Pleistocene in 2014. What was our ambition goal? Well, we, we actually had four big ambitious goals that are shown in that picture that, that I'm not gonna elaborate on. But the one that we took up for my lab, because this was a lot, large collaboration, including people uh, in the UK and two other labs in, in the United States, we wanted to identify the genomic basis of sensory innovations in a group of bats that's interesting because it's a group of bats that ranges. So uh, in Arizona, from Arizona and Texas, all the way into Argentina, including the islands. So if you've been in Puerto Rico or, or you, you've been in, in one of the Caribbean islands and you've seen giant, you know, just bats emerging out um, at dusk, you've seen these bats. Uh, if you've heard about bats that have to do with the production of tequila, you've, you've, you've heard about these bats. And if you've heard about vampire bats, bats that actually feed on blood, then you are aware of these bats because these bats include the vampire bat. So they have this tremendous diversity. And we were interested in probing that diversity and matching it to the diversity that they have in their senses and how they're using their senses. So uh, famously, and as we were discussing at the very beginning, bats echolocate, right? Like they're navigating this uh, space in darkness through the use of their sonar and through their hearing. But actually bats do many things besides decolocating. It also includes a very complex set of adaptations having to do with their sense of smell and as well as vision, which I'm actually not gonna talk about today. So we decided that in my lab, what we were gonna do, we we're gonna develop these tools of targeted sequence capture that we're gonna make it feasible to study more than 150 different species of bats at the same time at a reasonable cost. And I'm here to tell you, uh, about how that went and you know the, the, the sort of madness that it all brought. So the starting point is actually a really interesting uh, starting point. So in 2004, I think Linda Buck got her uh, Nobel Prize. And the reason she got her Nobel Prize is she was the first, uh, the first person to actually identify uh, olfactor receptors. And here's a three dimensional model of what an olfactory receptor is supposed to be like across their membrane. So mammalian olfactory receptors are really fascinating. Um, they embed into this biological membrane. We all have them in our noses. They are each neuron that is lining the epithelium inside of our noses is connected to the olfactory, to the brain via the olfactory bulb. And the processing of this information is something that has fascinated neurobiologists for a long time. But from the molecular standpoint, the discovery of olfactory receptors was fascinating because the mechanisms of perception of odors were not known, whereas the mechanisms of, of vision, for example, or the tactile mechanisms were relatively well understood for decades and decades. It was only until 2004 that we had a picture of how this is happening. And the way that this is proposed to be happening is that we have these receptors that are being expressed, we have this, this of the set of receptors that are present in the genome, one gets picked by a neuron and the neuron expresses that receptor and it's here as part of the epithelium and there are these volatile compounds and there's this specificity 
such that there's a ma matching specificity between the receptor and the volatile organic compound that binds to them. And when they bind, that's when they're sending the signal and that's how you come to smell something. So after binding, the receptors activate a switch that starts this mental representation of odor. And this mental representation of odor is actually quite complex. And that's something that we don't definitely don't study in the lab, but I know that there are people in the neurobio department who do study it because it actually incorporates a lot more information besides it incorporates across multiple neurons and all. But we were since we're studying bats and we're not studying you know, model organisms, we were interested just as staying at the level of the receptors, thinking about what these receptors, how diverse they are. So in this schematic representation, right, we have a receptor, like there's, the, the receptor diversity is reflecting the diversity of odorants, right? So we would be able to, if we had an animal uh, that is perceiving a mammal, these are all mammals actually, we're, we're talking about olfactory receptors in mammals, so the receptors are matching the molecules that are being put out by the odorants, right? And that diversity ends up be, being reflected in the genome. So what do I mean by that? Of the protein coding parts of the genome, which uh, some, you know, most of us uh, probably have heard that most of the genome is not protein coding, right? So the minority of the genome that is protein coding, the largest gene family in mammals is olfactory receptors. So something like three to 5% of the genome and in us humans, uh, it's encoding between, you know, something like 300 plus uh, different protein coding genes are olfactory receptors. So it's a significant proportion of the genome is being taken up by this. And that is in part a reflection, right, of the fact that there is this matching between the receptors and the odorants. So that, for example, I think a lot of us, we have these pets and we've heard that dogs and cats, for example, or rats, they actually have a much better sense of smell. And that is reflected in their olfactory receptor repertoires in that their olfactory receptor re repertoires, it's, 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 it's um, much larger than the one that we have. And the, the biggest that has been found is actually in elephants with a very huge uh, repertoire compared to ours. So the one that we're seeing here is in the males and we have 1400 olfactory receptors, whereas us, we only have 400 or so. Now, the process, the evolutionary process, which is where I'm coming out through this, through, through which this, this olfactory receptors evolve is very different from other genes that are only present in single copy. Because they're found, as you can see in this picture, they're actually found kind of in, in arrays, one next to the other. And they have all these regions of the DNA that are similar from one, from one olfactory receptors to the next. You can kind of see, why that would be because, um, because of the, the part that is exposed of the receptor and the part that's not exposed, um, some of them are highly similar across them. So it's extremely easy in the process of DNA replication to make a mistake and actually copy an, an extra one. At the same time, it's also extremely easy to make a mistake and delete an olfactory receptors. So the way that they evolve is very different. They evolve through gene duplication and um, and through deletion, so that we call a process called birth death. It's very different from other ones. But the process of gene duplication is actually rather hard to study. Why is it hard to study? Well, let's look at this picture. This is from 2018, which is not that long ago, even though that seems like it was in another life in, 20, in 2018. So this is a paper from the Nimura lab, and we have all of these different primates, right? And we have the, the, the two different classes of olfactory receptors. The pseudogenization is shown in very light blue, meaning the ones that have acquired the mutation that renders the protein non-functional, right? And we see that there's this diversity. For example, the colugo has a much greater diversity than do other primates, including the human, where we have fewer olfactory receptors and we have a large fraction of olfactory receptors that has become inactivated, that is uh, pseudogenized. In order to do this, why are people still working with such a small sample of primates uh, in studying duplication? Well, the answer is that it's super expensive. Why is it super expensive? Because it requires high quality genomes, right? So these primates that we see here, the human, the Proboscis and funky, all of them have relatively high quality genomes that you can compare. And so you can actually get a hold of all the different copies of the olfactory receptors that are present in the genome. And with those copies, you can then 
come up with a graph like this, or you come up, come up with a model of evolution. Actually, these models of the evolution, by the way, are pretty much in their infancy. There's, there's, a, there's a couple, there's a few out there, but they're not, they're not good or they're not as easy to, to follow as for regular molecular evolution that people study with single copies. So the models within and between species are not settled. Within species is practically like an open frontier. And yet they are exceedingly important. So the perception of smell may strike you as important or unimportant, but this same process of birth death governs important immune system genes like the major histocompatibility compatibility complex. So in other words, we really have this hindrance in our genomics analysis in that the duplication and the deletion of genes is poorly understood because it depends crucially on having this very high quality genomes that only few species have. So in order to scale up to hundreds of species, we came up with a strategy that was at the time that was gonna be a molecular shortcut that was gonna enable us to do that. So what was our molecular shortcut? Well, we'd begun with mRNA libraries. Now, on Monday, the entire world learned that there's gonna be an mRNA vaccine against COVID. I hope that, that people heard about this, right? So, and the first thing that I thought about was, oh my God, where are we gonna get all that liquid nitrogen, right? Because preserving mRNA, uh, <laughs> preserving mRNA is actually really hard, right? So in order to preserve this mRNA, what this implicated was traveling the world with nitrogen, with, with nitrogen tanks, which are highly suspicious, convincing pilots of letting us on with the nitrogen tanks and always being close to a, a, a nitrogen source so that we could replenish the tanks and we could maintain, maintain the ultra cold temperature. And something like that is gonna have to happen on a worldwide scale if we're gonna scale up this, this, um, this vaccine. So that's kind of like something to think about. So it started with having these mRNA libraries that took the epithelium, the olfactory epithelium of bats from a diverse set of species. Once we had that, we were able to, to generate this sensory transcriptome, and the sensory transcriptome gave us sequences that had never been found before uh, because these, this was just not studied and we didn't have the genomes. And with those sequences, we would generate probes, and the probe design was actually one of the trickiest steps because uh, even though we were using short read technology, so technology that's giving us 150 to 250 base pairs of DNA, we wanted to make sure that there was enough um, overlap between the different probes so that we could distinguish among closely related uh, olfactory receptors, among olfactory receptors that were differing by very little in their sequence. So this was something that um, we actually managed to do with Arbor Biosciences. They were very thoughtful in, in their support for our project. And once we had those probes, um, then we would hybridize those probes to DNA, which is really helpful because we wouldn't need the nitrogen anymore. And we would have samples like collections around the world that have tissues or even degraded tissues. We could actually put them through this system with the probes and then we would populate this whole thing. We would get every single one of the bats would be represented uh, in the sample. So that was the original idea. And I have to say, we didn't know that it would work. This is, this is one of those examples where where we were able to pull it off and to make something that seemed fairly impossible because of the characteristics of the genes, turn it into something possible. So what does that look like? So here's a picture from the vampire bat genome. That's a vampire bat that's flying towards you in that picture. And we've got a comparison. Um, the sequence capture is at the top. So the sequence capture is using the hybridization probes uh, that I just described. Uh, the transcriptome is uh, second from the top. And then you can see that the transcriptome kind of is catch as catch can in, in the sense that uh, some, some olfactory receptors are well represented and some olfactory receptors are not well represented, for example, in the class two. Then there's the Sanger sequencing. So this is the old fashioned sequencing where you take primers and you take DNA and put it with the primers and amplify through PCR. And you can see that that's a very sparse representation. It's actually a, very, a fairly biased sample of olfactory receptor subfamilies. And then the genome, of course, is the gold standard. This is a very high quality genome that cost about 150,000 at the time uh, to generate. Nowadays, and through another project that uh, I don't remember if I'm gonna be discussing, oh, I, I think I'm gonna be discussing one aspect to it. Through the bot one k project, we've been able to bring that price down from about 30,000 to about $15,000 for a genome. But the advantage of the sequence capture is that instead of having $15,000 per individual or per species, 
we can actually do this work at $250 per species. Now, here's where the big, big data comes in. And I'm gonna only show a schematic, um, both reflecting um, my, my, my actual uh, delegating of a lot of these responsibilities to all the people that you see here, but also just kind of making it, it, it interesting um, instead of just kind of like showing you the code that goes through this. So these are all the graduate students that have worked on this project, Laurel Yo, Paul Donut, uh, Elise Lauterbur and Nicolette Cipperly is still working on it, mostly because it's a very difficult task. So what do we do? We've got the sequencing of all of these olfactory receptors. We get millions of reads and then they go into assembly and then we have to pick the better assembly and then downstream of that, there is the actual thing that, that we care about in the project, which is the evolution of the olfactory receptors and the matching to particular function. So how do we do that? Well, we do that with a couple of tools uh, that people have developed, not for olfactory receptors and, and it shows. So one of them is called Hyde Piper and Hyde Piper is a series of, of scripts that call on spades, which is shown at the top and spades iterates through the assembly to pick for the better, the better quality assembly. So here's the hitch, here's where it gets interesting and I, I hope to leave ample time so that we can actually talk about it. So Hyde Piper, right? Uh, what, what we have when we're talking about billions of reads is we have hundreds of genes from tens of individuals and multiple iteration. But the Hyde Piper algorithm, when it calls spade, it doesn't clean up. So spade is running uh, a couple of, uh, let's say it's trying alternative assemblies. Let's, try to, let's say that it tries like five different ones, probabilistically trying to match up what is the better guess as to how to reconstruct that gene based on the probes that we gave it. Right, and it keeps all of those files. And then the, the next thing that happened is that LOL, maximum number of files, Seawolf is trying to kick us. We've got millions upon millions upon millions of files that are being kept and that are not cleaned, you know, not, are not cleaned automatically in the process. So we are kind of like at this limit of, of what we can generate, not because, of, not because of storage space in the size of the files, but because of the number of files that these algorithms are producing, right? And the way that they're handling um, this. So how do we improve? Well, hey, hey Liliana, th yep. I don't mean to interrupt. I think it will be a super cool project to sit down with your team and uh, uh, figure out efficient solutions to that. Because I mean, basically file systems as we have them now are like antiquated storage mechanisms that date back you know, to the beginning of computing. So there's there's other platforms we can use to store your data. And as an aside, my uh, significant other, Patricia, that I think uh, Heather knows, uh, she uh, looks after high performance computing for Mount Sinai, and they're swimming in genetic data, including uh, massive numbers of files, just as you describe. And so uh, there, there are solutions out there. We'd love to work with you. Well, work with us. I, I, I love that this presentation is serving as a cry for help, which it is. This presentation is partially a, a cry for help because of the, of the dimensions of this, you know, and, and the way that, you know, it, one size doesn't fit all. So thank you so much, Robert, for that, uh, for that aside. So how do we improve this situation that we're in? By the way, isn't this bat the cutest? So this is, you see that what that, what that bat has all over its face? It's pollen. This is a pollinating bat that goes and eats nectar from fact, from, uh, from flowers. So highly recommend. It's really beautiful bat. So we want to study the olfactory receptors. How did the bat find the flower? They find it through scent, right? We want to study the olfactory receptors in the bats. We could switch away from the uh, olfactory receptors, but that would be very sad. We could increase the file allocation is kind of the go-to. And I think that that's reflecting precisely what Robert said about this antiquated story, uh, this, this antiquated file management systems that we're relying on. We can reduce the throughput, right? Like we can just kind of reduce the throughput so that we don't max out. Or we can delete the intermediates, improve high piper. Notice how I don't have the alternative that Robert was proposing because I just, you know, like I'm working with what I got. So we need to improve. And I'm really looking forward to talking some more uh, with other teams that know how to do this. So now I'm gonna talk about the next project that um, is not as advanced. So it doesn't quite have the same problems but it's got some other problems uh, of its own. So what's the project? So bat 1K, there are 1400 species of bats that have been described in the world. And that's why bat 1K comes from. These are all the different families of bats. Um, 
the project is aiming to sequence the genomes of all bats. So more than 1,400 species generate genomes for all of them, right? But many of these uh, bats are only known from very few locations. They are nocturnal and they're really poorly known. So we're kind of striving to try to find bats wherever we can find them and put them in. Now you might wonder, actually, okay, you, you're not wondering why bats are so special. Bats are really super special and we all need to study them because we don't want to get caught into the next pandemic, which might have, uh, you know, might have a bat origin, just like several other coronavirus pandemics have had. Uh, when all is said and done, we're still kind of looking uh, for this one, but uh, and I can we can talk about that too. But the key point, the reason why one of the many reasons actually, this paper describes several other reasons why you should be interested in bats. But one of the key reasons is that bats have a really funny way of aging. So what this plot is showing you is called an allometry, which is a scaling relationship between mass and the maximum lifespan of different organisms. Now, there are only 19 species of mammal that relative to this scale live longer than humans. Of those 19 species, 18 are bats. So what does that mean living longer than humans in this scale? It means that bats live a lot longer than is expected given their allometry, given their body size. You can already see it in this plot that all the mammals are on one line and the bats are in a different line. The bats are Chiroptera. They're on a different line that is actually uh, way above. So they're actually kind of doing something different compared to other um, to our models. So we want to find out at the molecular level in terms of the genomics, what are bats doing that's different? And the way that we decided to go about it is we put together this uh, eager project, which is a special call of the NSF that's, that's meant to be, you know, it's meant to do things like reduce the cost of, of sequencing so that everybody else can do it cheap, more cheaply, which we have accomplished so far. So in the United States side of the project, because this is a global project that um, most of which is taking place in Germany in one of the Max Planck's, but with our scrappy NSF funded team here in the US, what we wanted to do was maximize the number of pairs of species that had very different longevity. And this longevity is, expe is expressed as the ratio of the observed to the expected longevity. So you can see that there's a bat Myotis branti, Brant's myotis, that lives six times longer than is expected. So this is the famous bat that's a 10 gram bat, so it's a, smaller than a mouse, that, that was found to live to the age of 42, right? An individual was found to, be li to live to that age. But you can see that there are other bats, including Myotis lucivagus, which is um, the, uh, the bat that's most affected by white nose syndrome here in the United States, that actually lives almost five times as, as, as long as is expected. And you see other pairs here. So the goal of, the, of our project was to sequence these and compare them. And we started off, so earlier this year, we actually published this paper, um, came out on the cover of Nature, showing some of the procedures, the secrets of the bat clay, generating reference quality genomes for bats at a relatively low price and um, you know, obviously at a much shorter time than the reference uh, genomes that came out, for example, for humans, which took a very long time. So here's more of an example about how to keep data tracking going across a collaboration and how to kind of, so consider for a moment that this, this paper with the bats is only six bats. There were only six bats. We're aiming to go to 1000 bats, but we started only with six, right? And so this is Phylostomus discolor, the pale spear nose bat. It's, um, it's a tropical bat here in the Americas that is uh, actually primarily frugivorous. It's a wonderful, this is a wonderful picture. And here's what it looks like when you go to NCBI, right? So you go to NCBI and it says, okay, let's go look at the transcriptome profiling, right? And so if you press on this accession number, so it's telling me, okay, fine. I know where this RNA came from. I know how to annotate this genome. It's in here. I'm gonna go click on that and see what happens. Here's what you get. You get the metagenomics of hot spring at Unkeshwar. So we see that there's this broken link. You know, it's like we've, we've got only six genomes, right? Only six genomes and already in the submitted work on NCBI, we have that. So this makes us, this makes us think. So the reason why we were looking into this is because we wanted to use the reference quality data. We didn't want to use some of the 
intermediate step data so that it was consistent with everything that had been published in some subsequent analysis that we're doing right now, preparing for this paper that we have uh, that's due at the end of the year, and that is comparing uh, immune system proteins across all of these bats. And already with only six new genomes, we already see that we have this broken thing. So how do we scale up? So here's a question, right? Here's the idea. How do we scale up this quality control? By the way, this is Brightonolophus. Uh, this is a horseshoe bat. You can see the horseshoe in the face. It's a very pretty bat. They are not here in the Americas, but they're still wonderful. So this is one of the bats, both bats that I've shown. Um, are represented in the six genomes that we have. So the goal is to go for for hundred for thousands, but with fewer than ten, we are already wrong. So hand curation has obviously failed in the sense that these were hand curated and were submitted, right? Do we have to have another team at about one k that does an NCBI double check? Is that what we need? Like basically double the number of hands that go into this? Uh, how do we change our procedures for quality control? so that we actually don't get to surprises, that we are actually PIs in the BAT 1K project, and we are already seeing the problems. I mean, let alone, for example, a student or somebody, imagine somebody who's scraping this project automatically, right? They're going, in, they're, they're going to go looking for the RNA-seq of a bat, and they're going to find uh, a bunch of DNA from a hot spring. This is going to be show up in their analysis as a huge outlier, uh, and, and it's going to be very confusing. So that's uh, sort of the question about how, how do we go about this? How do we scale in a situation that's in a system that's already not working? And I think it's the NCBI system. I'm sure those of you who work on genomics are aware of, of sort of the difficulties that NCBI has had in, in sort of taking on this onslaught of new data. But from our side, how can we control that? Okay, so the final project is kind of the most fun of all. And, and the one that I think that uh, you know, people think about a lot. So this is a human frontiers of science project. And the thing to know about the shrews is that they do something very funny. They're born in the spring and they grow throughout the spring. They grow to be larger, just like every other mammal. And then at the end of the summer, as you can see here, July, from July, roughly through March, they shrink. What do I mean by they shrink? They shrink their head, they shrink their brain, they shrink their liver, they shrink their heart. They shrink organs that in all other mammals don't ever grow again and don't actually regenerate. And it's one of the, you know, one of the key questions that we're facing with all of these aging populations around, or aging populations of humans around the world is, is basically what do we do with all these organs that don't regenerate, right? In other organisms that are not mammals, certain organs regenerate, not, 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 in, not in mammals. And so this shrew, you know, shrinks and then regrows, right? And importantly, shrinks the brain. The seasonal change, insofar as it's been studied, it's triggered by the environment. So if you actually take the, take the shrews and put them in captivity and just give them, uh, uh, you know, keep the day length and the temperature the same and abundant food, then they actually don't, don't get um, a change. And the question that we have, or the question that we took up in my lab was what's the molecular basis of this? How do, how do uh, you know, what are the molecular signals that are happening in this period of shrinkage? And just as interestingly, during the period of regrowth. So the plan that we had for this is that we're gonna lean pretty hard on the existing genome. So what, we were, what we're gonna do is uh, get obtained samples from shrews at five different key stages, including juveniles, shrink, sh completely shrunk ones, and the baseline of the adult. And we were also we're also going to do an experiment that's already taking place of giving them a drug called etomoxir that has an interesting pro property of blocking the mechanisms in the mitochondria uh, for taking up lipids. And the idea is that part of this or, 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 or what we were trying to get at with, with that treatment is that when they're shrinking their brain, they're actually using some of the lipids that they have, uh, they're using it as food. They're, they're basically eating their brain during this period um, and to see what the atomic sear would do, if the atomic sear would have the, the expected effect. So how do we do that? What do we mean by, by leaning hard on the genome? Well, 
in order to, to look at the molecular signals, and this is William Thomas, who is my graduate student who's working on the project, um, and, and uh, it includes parts of his dissertation, is that we have we get the samples from Germany where the shrews are captured and, and, and you know, shipped over in, in dry ice um, to maintain the RNA, and we do RNA-seq, we undergo this assembly. But a key component of the assembly is to have information from the genome. Right, so we need the genome to help with the assembly, um, especially if we want to do quantification. So, in the first application that I showed, we actually weren't interested in the quantification. We just wanted to see what genes were there, and that's relatively easy to do even without a genome. But if we want quantification, we actually have having the clarity of the mapping helps a lot, and that map requires a genome. So the initial results have been promising. We have things like differentiation. This is a principal components analysis of the cortex hippocampus, hypothalamus. You can see the olfactory uh, bulb. The OB is olfactory bulb is uh, very differentiated re relative to other brain regions. The cortex stands out as well. So we don't have stages yet. This is a single stage. These are, um, these are young of the year in the, in the summer, but those data are forthcoming from the next batch. The trouble is, that in doing these annotations, in doing these assemblies with the genome, we discovered that the genome is terrible. So what do I mean by terrible? Okay, so the genome of the shrew is a little bit smaller than the human genome. The, the human genome is like 3 billion uh, base pairs. This one is about 2.4 uh, billion. And so I wanna, I, I, I wanna draw your attention to a couple of places. One, the number of scaffolds, right? So how many pieces are arranged together from this genome? Well, there's more than 12,000 pieces, right? The number of contexts, meaning how many pieces that don't have large spaces between them are assembled? Well, there's 200,000 contexts. In other words, this, this genome is really like shredded, a bunch of shredded DNA, right? Uh, there's no chromosomes that are assembled because we are talking about a genome that uh, really um, is going to have a huge amount of gaps and it's, it's, it doesn't really provide the, the kind of structural information, meaning the location of genes with one another and, and the kind of information that we would need for that. So lucky for us, thanks to the human frontiers of science, we can actually throw money at the problem. We can solve this problem. We're right now in the beginning of planning to sequence the genome. Uh, in part, actually not just because the RNA-seq, we could survive, we could survive having this RNA sequencing without the genome, but we're also using proteomics and it would be a lot better if we actually had better template for proteomics. Um, it's also going to make the RNA-seq analysis. We, we determined that the cost, the cost benefit, um, you know, analysis of do, doing a high quality $15,000 genome relative to doing things the way that we've done them here uh, so far, um, the, getting the genome would be a lot better. And with that, so that's, that's what we're thinking, but if anybody has some, some other cheaper ideas, those are welcome too. Um, and with that, I just wanna thank you on behalf of some of my lab, some of my lab members are presented here. Thank you. Thanks, Liliana. Mm -hmm. um, any, any questions? Hey, Liliana, thanks very much. Could you comment a, a little bit more on the software pipeline that you're using for the genomics analysis there? The only one I'm interested, I'm aware of, is the GATK coming out of the Broad Institute, but I think that's mostly directed towards humans. So, what mm -hmm. do you use? Mm. Yeah, we're using something called Augustus and Caesar. So we're using a different. We're definitely not using the the Broad Institute. So the Broad Institute, up until now, the Broad Institute is only doing short read, and um, the you know this this but one K is very very. You know, it has a, a very strong representation of people from, from the Max Planck, including the Max Planck in Dresden, that's the Genomics Institute. And the innovation that they're doing, there's actually kind of a mirror of that happening at Rockefeller right now. The, the, what they're bringing to the table is that they're using uh, at least two forms of long read. So together with the short read technology, we're using PacBio uh, and we are using um, BioNano. Right, so so that we can get this optical mapping, we can actually get like the whole the whole assembly. So, uh, Caesar, I can type them up. Hold on, let me. Where's my? Where do I type? What do I do? Hold on. Uh, I'll probably put it in the I'm, chat. 
I'm thinking this is these are the aligners. I I I don't think um, Caesar and Augustus. I I think um, I I think these are actually uh, not what you need, Robert. I think I'm just going to put a link to the paper actually, because um, the paper has a gigantic um, section. Um, hold on. Nature. Okay, hold on. And the paper is uh, open access. So, so yeah, so we're not, we're not using the Brown Institute. We're not using that. Uh, we're not using that at all because it's not adequate for the type of technology that we have. Okay, here it is. Okay, good. Th thanks, Lily. And uh, right, I'll uh, uh, circle back to you and, and start the conversation about um, trying to find a better a hardware platform for you. Yeah, that would be fantastic. I mean, like we've we've struggled. We've definitely struggled. Um, and and this is, you know, when you think about it, this is kind of like a relatively small issue, right? Like, well, it's it's very. I mean, I, I guess it grows large for us because of the repeated nature of the genes, right? The genes are no, no, mo most people are interested in like one gene here, another gene there, and you can, you can do them in parallel, many thousands, but then you're done, right? With this, with this olfactory receptors, you're not done because they're so similar to each other. So you have to, you have, you, you, your, your probabilistic step of, of trying alternatives gets larger. So. Yeah. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Hey, Luna, you had a, um, I know you and I have talked about survivorship uh, quite a bit in the past, and you had said that well, like 18 of 19 of those ultra long-lived uh, animals were were bats. What was the what was the 19th? Ah. It's the naked mole rat. Oh. The infamous naked mole rat. So here's a funny story. This week I met with uh, Jerome Smars because we have a project, those data that, that I presented of, of the two curves, right? The, the two lines, those are from a paper from five years ago. And I wanted to use some of the tools that Jerome has built for understanding the different allometries, right? And he was telling me, oh no, I mean, I found this thing, there was this rodent and it was like a huge outlier. It must be like the X on the Y got flipped. And I was like, no, it's called a naked mole rat. <laughs> so, yeah, the 19th is the naked mole rat. Oh, that's funny, interesting. Yeah. And people, so, so that, the naked mole rat has a really fascinating story as a, so the naked mole rat has become an aging model, right? And the naked mole rat became an aging model in spite of the NIH, not, not because like the NIH did not fund the efforts to make it into a, um, an aging model. And it's now like an accepted aging model that lots of people are, are, are working on looking at the, you know, sort of basically the molecular basis and how does it, how does the naked mole rat control cancer? How does the naked mole rat prevent aging, et cetera? So it's an interesting story there uh, oh, about sorry. funding. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to, so in the bat community, we're, we're, you know, we're trying to make bats into a thing, right? Like in, in the aging dimension, <sighs> wish us luck. Yeah, um, yeah, it's always better to have a model system than a non-model system. So, so Leniana, another quick question, and perhaps a little bit orthogonal to your talk, but mm -hmm. uh, many uh, other disciplines who are, are, are similarly drowning in data have turned maybe out of optimism or, or simply desperation. So some of the tools of modern AI machine learning and stuff. So mm -hmm. how is that impacting your own field or, or are these tools yet to really make any penetration? I think there are a lot of, a, a lot of people sort of trying to pitch the next big thing of AI in genomics for sure, right? But it's not, it's not a series of tools that we're using quite yet, but uh, this is a good point about it in that, so there's the world of genomics, you know, for example, the world of personalized medicine genomics, right? That's where the costs of sequencing are so low, et cetera. And what that really means is not that the cost of sequencing are so low, the cost of resequencing, right? The cost of doing a relatively low coverage genome that maps out to these very good human genomes that we already have for lots of diversity of human diversity that exists out there are super low. And I think that in that world, the applications have been developed and a bunch of them are proprietary. I think in our world, we have just, meaning, meaning us, but 1K, our little project, or oh, it's not a little project anymore, but um, I think we are getting to, we are only now building up to this stage where we are drowning in those data and we're going to need to turn to those alternatives. And it's a very good thing that you brought it up because um, 
I'm not just part of Bio1K, I'm part, through Bio1K, I'm part of this thing called the Earth Biogenome Project. And the goal of the Earth Biogenome Project is to sequence the genomes of every organism in the world, right? So we have big dreams, right? But the way that this has been scaled up, so we meet every year at Rockefeller University and to the best that I've seen, the way that people have circumvented these data problems is just by growing bigger and growing bigger. And I have not yet, you know, so, so there's a lot of discussion of, about computational efficiency in the algorithms for devoted to assembly and devoted to, to, to the kind of probabilistic exercises that I, that I described. But there isn't a lot of discussion as to how do we deal with the masses of data that we have. That is not a discussion that is being had right now, but it's one that we should anticipate if our goal is to scale up again from like six genomes that we made that are already having like terrible mistakes in their in their rollout uh, to uh, going you know to going big and getting thousands and thousands. You're muted, Robert. Thanks. I do that several times a day, so great. Um, yeah, so you made a reference to computational efficiency of the software. And I mean, coming back to GATK, because that's the, the only thing I'm familiar with, it's kind of famous for being actually really badly implemented. I mean, a bunch of Perl and other scripts using algorithms that aren't particularly the most efficient. And again, using zillions and zillions of tiny files, which are very inefficient to access from the file system. So, uh, but the trouble is, is lots of people have optimized those pipelines, mm -hmm. but they won't take the optimizations back because everything's got to get certified and qualified. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a very onerous thing. So they can stick with what they do. So what's the situation in your software stack? Are they more open? Can the community contribute? I think that we, we, would, we could have a, a potential to do, to do exactly that. This is definitely not, you know, like I'm going to write this down because this is definitely, you know, these are kind of not the kind of steps that we do in my lab. We just, we're just kind of like, deploying the tools that are available and bumping up against the obstacles there, right? As opposed to thinking about the creation of new tools. I get the sense that people circumvent these problems just by, you know, getting the bigger storage or getting the bigger machine, even though, even though we absolutely, I, I know about GATK, I, the number of discussions that we have about like, some pipeline in the bat, some some small part of bat one KB in Perl and the problems that that's causing us. We spent months meeting as a group to get before we got that nature paper out. Uh, so we can absolutely, but we don't have computer science. We don't have we have bioinformaticians. We don't have computer scientists in the room with us, and that's definitely to me. This is sounding to me like a highly fundable frontier. Is what I'm hearing now. It, it is quite fundable and under NSF there's explicitly there's multiple programs but the most natural match that I've been involved in in the past and I'm now is uh, called CSSI uh, I remember, cyber something or other infrastructure software whatever but I mean it, it's basically there to fund community software infrastructure oh. and you know if, if we could identify a community and a real need here, then uh, these projects can be substantial and uh, and run a while. Well, I, I wouldn't be averse to that, especially if we want to again, if if we if we actually want to make the assembly, especially especially assemblies from long read, basically looking to the future, thinking about what are the people, what are people going to be doing in ten years, right? And how are they going to be going about? Are they going to like patch up Perl one more time in GATK, or are they going to be using something completely different that actually, that maybe be object director or something? I don't know, but uh, it would be fantastic to have the likes of you in the room when we are discussing these things because right now we aren't. We're just talking to each other, and so we are kind of we remain within the realm of the possible, which is often very clunky, as you have seen. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm familiar with I mean, it's it's the engineering solution, right? You 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 build with the tools you got, and so that's us. That's uh, that's us. That's us biologists. Uh, well, I I, 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 mean, I speak for all biologists, but that's us biologists working with this non-model yeah. systems for sure. Yeah. Well, it's it it would be me doing biology, right? If I'm using a computer, <laughs> right? That's right. Yeah, all cyber fish swimming in our oceans. This would be fantastic, actually. The cyber, if we could, if we could, you know, find a way to make this into some, for example, 
the, the, the meeting that happens is it's called the Vertebrate Genome Project. And it also draws people from the Earth Biogenome Project. Um, and we just had our meeting a couple, like maybe six weeks ago. Um, and actually having the vision of sort of the kind of the high level vision of let's implement something that's going to create this cyber infrastructure that doesn't depend on Pearl, that doesn't depend on things that were written in the 90s, that would really make things better for everybody. That would be transformative in ways that what we're doing right now isn't. Excellent. Are there, are there other, other questions? Oh, I just want to make sure what's in the chat there. No, that's just, that's just from you guys. All right. Well, I'm going to go into- You know where to find Liliana on the internet yes. like everyone else. And um, I'm online. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Liliana, for the for the presentation, and thanks all of you for coming. And yeah, it would be it would be great to um, yeah see if there are ways that to to follow up. Um, Absolutely. Like 